Let's talk about microarrays. As in micro, the genome on the head of a pin, or at least on a microscope slide. This could be any genome, a human genome, a fruit fly genome, a bacterial genome. Array simply refers to the fact that the genome has been cut up into separate DNA fragments. All of the possible fragments you can get, for example, by cutting DNA with restriction endonucleases, or as many cloned fragments as you can get. You can put into an array on a slide no bigger than a conventional microscope slide. It might take two or three slides or perhaps a few more to hold a large genome, but you can get the whole genome into a very small space. This then is the genomic approach to studying more than one gene at a time. So this is global genomic studies looking at all of the genes of an organism at once. So here's a picture of some chromosomes representing at least some of the DNA of a genome. And again to remind you, the genome is the informational or DNA content on an organism's chromosome. So how do we make and then screen a microarray? It consists of several steps. After you get the DNA by doing DNA extractions from appropriate cells and then treating the DNA to get the fragments. But at that point, you're ready to do spotting, followed by probing, and then of course the science, the interpretation. So let's take a look at how that works. From the get-go, microarray production has been robotized. It had to be because we're talking about literally thousands or tens of thousands of little spots of DNA that have to end up on a piece of glass. So there's a robot that pipettes DNA from a row of DNA samples like this and passes them to the surface of a slide where they are deposited. In the next step, the robot shifts to the next set of tubes and then deposits a set of spots in a row right next to the first row. And this just keeps up. This is a very crude illustration of a very refined process to be sure. But it works and the spots are very tiny. If that's a microscope slide on the right side here. So here we have a microscope slide that has been spotted with all the DNA samples you can get on it, which is many times more than what you see here. This is an actual portion not the whole thing, a portion of a microarray. Each little colored dot represents the position of one spot of DNA that was on one of these microscope slides. In this picture alone, I suspect there are perhaps two or three thousand spots. And that's just a small region of the slide. What has happened here is that the microarray has been probed with cloned DNA or even RNA samples that have been made fluorescent by chemically tagging them with a fluorescent dye. If you really look closely, you can see that there are at least three colors of fluorescence showing up here, suggesting that this microarray had been probed with three different sequences at the same time. On the lower right side is part of one of these boxes within the microarray, shown at high power to more clearly show you the reddish, greenish, and somewhat yellowish uh, different fluorescent spots. And these are visualized with a standard fluorescence microscope. These days, you can go and buy a human genome microarray, or you can buy any of a number of others, especially those of the model organisms like the worm uh, Ceneroditis elegans or Drosophila melanogaster. Or if you have an organism that is not one of the model organisms and you have a grant, you can pay for a service that will make a microarray for you. And then, providing you with slides, you may then do the various kinds of analyses or ask a variety of questions. So here is the sort of thing that one might be able to ask with a microarray. And this is not an inclusive list. You could ask which genes are active in a cell at one time versus another by taking, for example, just the RNAs of those cells at the two different times and seeing which genes light up in the microarray, which would tell you which genes are there RNAs for in your RNA sample. You could do this with cDNA probes as well, which is uh, essentially the same thing. You could also ask, what's the effect of treating a cell with a hormone? Does the hormone turn on a whole new set of genes that were not on before, and does it perhaps turn off another set? These are genome-level questions. Before this use of microarrays, the best we could do was check to see if a gene that we expected was turned on by a hormone was turned on by a hormone. Now we can do this in genomic style. We could ask questions that are quantitative in nature. 
It turns out the microarrays are excellent for measuring things. So for example, we can say how active are genes at one time versus another time or in one tissue versus another tissue because we can quantify how much of the probe that we're using is actually binding to one spot in an array versus another. And we can ask simple questions of paired microarrays, for example, of two different organisms probed with similar probes to ask whether the genome of one organism contains similar genes to that of another. So that's another use of microarrays. And here it is actually limitless. One can imagine many different questions that you could ask using microarrays that get at genome-level questions.